glad to have you. For everybody enjoying our opening days of June. Well, I'll tell you, you know, I mean, I, this is a constant uh, source of conversation. But can you believe how time flies? <laughs> we just got out of January, and here we are, June 5th. Anyways, glad to have you all here today. Let's take a look at our announcement. Sunday School, of course, following morning worship. Ladies meeting Friday, June 10th at 1 p.m. So that is this Friday. All ladies welcome. And then Men's Father's Day breakfast, June 19th at 9 a.m. Um, we're going to put the graduates that are connected with the church in the bulletin on um, the 12th. And so if I, you have somebody, you know, one of your kids is graduating from something and I don't know about it yet, let me know, write it down. Uh, I know I got to find out where Brooke graduated from. That's one that I uh, went on deal with. I don't know if there's anybody else. Don't want to leave anybody out. So that's coming up. And then of course the Men's Father's Day breakfast, June 19th. Let's take a look at our prayer list here. We have this little Bridget, this is Mary Ann Reese's cousin, granddaughter, two-year-old child, uh, has a brain cancer that's affecting the eyesight, I guess primarily, but this is going to require 12 to 15 months of chemo. So let's keep little Bridget in prayer and ask God for a miracle. I said before, I... One thing to see men suffer, um, we're supposed to be able to take it, I guess. Women shouldn't have to suffer because they should be treated special. Thank you. True. <laughs> That's the way I was raised. That's the way it was in our house. You were supposed to treat women special. They could hit you, but you never ever hit them. <laughs> and then, they didn't put it that way in those terms. <laughs> Experience ends up dictating something like that. But anyways, it's true. You know, and then to see children, little children like we just went through this long one and now this little Bridget, we just uh, want to ask God to set her free from this. Debbie Ritter's having an adrenal gland tumor removed. Uh, that's June 24th. And uh, Tommy Gallagher's here is uh, scheduled for his uh, chemo radiation. It looks like a couple of weeks he's going to go down. Okay, so that's good. Uh, Noel in and out of the hospital. Jack, I talked to him this week. He's doing pretty good. And so we need to keep him in prayer. But uh, he's completed his antibiotic cycle. And uh, so keep him in prayer. Jan Yeselevich. Uh, doing good. She could conceivably come here for the second half of the service. Okay? Um, she's still sore. You can imagine um, heart surgery is uh, really amazing. And of course, we have the rest of our prayer list here. And then we got the New Dignity Wisconsin Church. Bill Basie's their pastor. Missionary of the Week is Doug Brennerwald. He actually ministers in Chicago to the Muslim population there. So, uh, pray for Doug. And Evelyn Zotero is our senior of the week. Anybody else ought to be added to the prayer list here this morning? My brother, possible surgery June 9th. Yes. Howard Young. Uh, June 9th, you said? Yes, possible. They're doing uh, some testing, and then if you can stand it, then they're going to do it for amputation. Yeah, keep power down in your prayers. Anybody else? Are we more comfortable today? 
Is it too cold? <coughs> Just about right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Good. Last week I heard it was too cold. And... All right. I'll tell you what. Let's turn to 243.
the history behind the nation of Israel and you're dealing with them. And, uh, so we, we read about you and we've learned a lot about you through your word. <coughs> We're so grateful for the gift of the Holy Spirit. So these aren't just words on a page, but they literally come to life in our heart. And we have a dynamic, living, personal relationship with Jesus Christ. The King of kings and Lord of lords, he who spoke all things into being, who rules and reigns over the heavens and the earth for all eternity, sitting at the right hand of the Father at this very moment, in your words to him, sit here, my son, until I make all your enemies my footstool. Our Heavenly Father, we are so grateful that in Christ Jesus, sickness, suffering, loneliness, forlornness, death, separation, chaos, hate, evil, all the things that plague this cursed earth in Christ Jesus have been destroyed. And as they play out, we look forward to the day of Christ's return when he will establish this universe as his true kingdom. And everything that is not in Christ will be set apart to their own will and wishes. And all those things that are in Christ Jesus, the world of godliness, the universe of holiness, will be with Jesus Christ forever. We look forward to that day, our Heavenly Father, but in the meantime, we need wisdom and guidance to make it through this world. We get a lot of conflicting reports, and you know, frankly, we read in the Bible about rank evil, about false prophets, deceit, deception. And we know that our hearts are susceptible to that very thing. So our Heavenly Father, we need you to pour out your Holy Spirit upon us in power. We don't want to just feel uh, some energizing or some excitement or some enthusiasm. Uh, that's all wonderful. But we need the indwelling presence and power of God to guide us, to open our hearts and minds to the things that are really important, and to give us wisdom and discretion and understanding, make good and right and wise choices in the face of things that are not easy to choose and so often are deceptive. And so often there's not really just a clean-cut choice, but a lot of times there's two paths to take. And you allow us to make that choice. So our Heavenly Father, pour out your Spirit upon us that we might have wisdom and understanding from on high. We're grateful that you revealed yourself to us as the great healer. And that all who are on this prayer list and all who walk with you will be healed completely and totally. Now that might happen by a miracle here in this world. It might happen in this time and age by care of doctors and nurse staff and medical people and just folk in our home who care and take time and comfort and let time do some healing. You put incredible recuperative powers in our bodies. And we're grateful for all that. We also know, Father, that when that doesn't happen here in this world, we know when we pass into the next, we will be completely and totally healed. And there will be no teardrops, there will be no sickness, there will be no suffering. And there will going to be no animosity. The curse will be absolutely played out. So thank you for all these things, our Father. We pray today for our friends up in, over in New Diggings, Wisconsin, and our friend Bill Basie. I ask your deepest and richest blessing upon those folk, Lord, and I pray for Bill and Joyce. My older brother by a different mother. Bless that man and his work. Fill his wife with peace and happiness and strength. We pray that that new Dignity's church might be a lighthouse in that community. We pray the same thing for our friend Doug Grenewald, his work out there in Chicago. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for raising him and his breed up and giving them the gifts and the talents and the abilities and then them realizing that they want to use those things for Christ to make sure men, women, and children hear the good news. Because as the Bible says, you know, blessed are the feet of those who bring the good news. Because if you don't hear, how can you believe? If you don't hear, how can you understand? If you don't hear, how can you ever be saved? 
And so, our Heavenly Father, we're thankful for those like Doug Gretelwald who bring the good news to often very hostile and difficult places. We pray for Evelyn Totero, and we ask you to watch over her again today. We're grateful that you have preserved her life to this hour. And we're grateful for the people up there at Carbondale who take care and watch over her. Uh, we ask your deepest and richest blessing on all those who gather together to do the work of angels. Bless and watch over each one in Jesus' name. Our Heavenly Father, we could pray all day and it'd be a worthy enterprise. Surely our country needs prayer, this world needs prayer. Uh, but our Heavenly Father, what we need more than anything else is to come before you and receive your great gift of mercy. And so, Father, we gather together around you today and we ask you to hear and answer all our prayers as we say together, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread, and give us our trespasses, and we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever.
And uh, there's so much pollen in the air now. It's unbelievable. But if your voice is, or your throat's dry, a black jelly bean. Nothing <laughs> will moisten your mouth. It's a black jelly bean. Well, maybe there are some things, but this is one of the things that really affect me. Proverbs 1 through 7, verses, chapter 1, verse 1 through 7. The Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, the king of Israel. For gaining wisdom and instruction, for understanding in words of insight, for receiving instruction in prudent behavior, doing what is right, just, and fair, for giving prudence to those who are simple. Knowledge and discretion to the young. Let the wise listen and add to their learning. And let the discerning get guidance. For understanding proverbs and parables, the sayings and riddles of the wise. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your holy word. Because again, Lord, you have really blessed us down here in this world. You not left us as orphans. You have sent your absolute essence, presence, the spiritual essence of God to dwell in our heart in the person of the Holy Spirit. And he lives in our heart and he reassures us that we're the children of God he inspires, he inflames our conscience, enlightens us to make good choices and to reject things that would be harmful or destructive, for helping us to understand things that are all too often very confusing and to make choices of things that very often are really hard to make any separation there. Our Heavenly Father, we're so grateful that you have poured out your Holy Spirit to speak to us personally and inside our soul. But we're also grateful for the holy written words of God. That we have something objective on the outside of us that we can look at and see how it lines up with what the Spirit is telling us. And get real guidance and real wisdom and direction. We're so thankful for the Church of Jesus Christ. The people who Jesus Christ dwells in by the power of the Spirit, we're surrounded by people who have wisdom, who have experience, who have made choices. Sometimes they make very poor choices, and they're here to tell us the consequences of doing foolish things. But we're also glad, like the same people, they make great choices, good choices, wise ones, and can add or offer guidance and instruction in making decisions that will enhance our lives. Thank you for all these things, Father. Come and speak to us in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, these are the Proverbs of Solomon, son of David, the king of Israel, which is fascinating because when we read about Solomon. He was going to build the temple. Actually, King David was going to build the temple in Israel. And David said one day, you know what, Lord? This just isn't right. I've got a magnificent house. It's fitted, fitted with great cedar wood and all kind of paneling. And it's just a really wonderful, wonderful house. But Lord, you do all in a tent. We've carried this tent through the wilderness, our fathers. And it's been preserved to this day. It's made out of animal skins, it's made out of canvas, got brass fittings, copper fittings, different things. Lord, eh, it's special, but it's just a tent. And it's not right that I should dwell in such a fine house and you should have such an ordinary place. And the Lord came to David. When you read about that in Chronicles, it's fascinating. It's David, I appreciate what you're doing, but this isn't for you. David, you've got blood on your hands. And that's nothing wrong with that. I raised you up to be a king. I raised you up to be a warrior. I took you from that shepherd's field. 
you were up there learning how to take care of sheep. You thought you were just taking care of sheep. But while you were doing that, you were really learning the skills and things you'd use as a king with people. David, you've led these people into battle. You've defended my nation. In fact, you've even expanded it. And those who would do evil have been pushed back and put in check thanks to your work. David, that's what I called you to do. But I didn't call you to build a temple. That's going to be the work of your son. You know, that's a fascinating piece of wisdom right there. We're not all here supposed to do everything. You know, it's interesting. The church is supposed to be a witness for Jesus Christ. And go into all the world and preach the gospel? Well, that's what the church does. It's not what every individual does. There are individuals, such as we talked about Doug Grenewald this morning. Uh, we've known some missionaries over the years, and uh, they want to go to the most difficult environment. It seems like they choose to go someplace, and they're, pe they're, they're usually a special breed of people. Very often, they have peculiar personalities, okay? The more you get to know them, uh, they do things that ordinary people don't. We had a missionary staying at our house one day in Newcastle, or Nanako, and he'd go out on the back, back porch, and we had a little uh, redwood deck around the back sliding glass door, and the sidewalk went right down along here. And he'd go out in the morning and stand there. Praise the Lord, brother! So good to see you! And he'd start witnessing to anybody who walked by. And does anybody else do that? Helen? No, you don't. I'll say have a blessed day or something. <laughs> say have a blessed day. What normal people might say. We're just kind of friendly to people. But these people who end up being missionaries, they have that kind of personality. They thrive on that. And they don't understand often why everybody else doesn't have the same personality and why everybody doesn't do the same thing. We're all different. We all have different skills, different talents, different abilities. We're made for the Lord, by the Lord, for different purposes. He has an, a, a magnificent plan that we'll see something about in a little while. And all together, the church bears witness to the world. And so anyways, here's Solomon, the son of David. And when he built that temple, it's magnificent. The ancients, ancient historians say there was nothing like it in the ancient world. There was so much gold paneling and gold plating. It was just fabulous. And when it came time to dedicate the temple, the Lord came to Solomon and said, what do you want? I've raised you to shepherd my people. And Solomon said, Lord, would you give me the wisdom to guide your people? Would you give me a heart that I could be compassionate toward them and lead them with wisdom? You know what it's like being a leader of a nation? I watched... We sit in the comfort of our living room and watch politicians make decisions all the time. And I watched a, one of my favorite reporters say the other day, do you, do you feel that you have blood on your hands because of this? I said, holy cow. Uh, politicians make decisions all the time. And no matter what decision they make or what law they make, somebody it's going to end up hurting. And some people it's going to end up helping. You've got to split that. Remember King Solomon had to make a decision one day? There was a mother. Two, two women came. One had stolen the baby from her friend, I guess, in the night. Wanted to raise that baby for her own. Like something out of a Lifetime movie, right? Yeah. And so she steals the baby and says it's hers. And they end up coming to Solomon. And King Solomon has to make a decision. He says, okay, here's what we're going to do. Get that sword, that special sword we got back there in the back room. We'll cut the baby in half and give half to each of the mothers. And immediately one said, okay, go ahead. But the other one said, oh, no, no, let, let her have the, the whole baby. And then Solomon said, 
we just found out who the mother is, who has the real compassion and the real care. He made this decision based on that. And that's a sample of what happens in life. We make making choices all the time. And so Solomon said, Lord, if you just give me the wisdom and the understanding to guide your people, that's what I really want. And God came to Sam Solomon and said, Solomon, you didn't ask for riches. You didn't ask for wealth. You didn't ask for prestige or power or any of those things that the world craves. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you that wisdom. I'm going to give you that understanding. And Solomon, you're also going to get the wealth that's going to come with being a king. And put it into context. We're still talking about a human being. Solomon is still a man. He's a human being. Given the wisdom by God to lead his people and to gather wise sayings together, but we don't always see Solomon acting so wise in his private life. The laws of God, given by Moses, where they're not supposed to assemble together wives. They were not supposed to commune with the foreign nations because they'll lead you astray. I want you to marry one of the Hebrew women, okay? And stick with her. But we read Solomon, I think he had 300 wives. Yeah. 700 concubines. <laughs> so he's got a stable of a thousand. Right? Ready for action at his bidding. Even at that rate, uh, if you were going to have your audience with the king, and you're one of the women in the stable, that's basically like every third year you get to be with them. I don't know if that's a good deal or bad for the women. They might be sitting there thinking, really? I only got to be around him? Once every third year, and I get all the benefits of being the king's wife, it's a good deal. But for Solomon, it wasn't such a good deal. And it led him astray and led him into bad places. You know, it's a hard truth, but a real truth. Okay? I preach the word of God and teach it. But I struggle with life just like everybody else. Okay? Liable to the same temptations, liable to the same tests, liable to the same trials, maybe more so willing to do stupid things. Okay? And so God takes us and He gives us abilities beyond what we naturally have. We call them spiritual gifts. And they enable us to make a contribution to God's people and to the world. And it comes from behind. It doesn't, it's, it's, it doesn't change your humanity. The apostles were still as human as you can imagine. Right? We read these stories in the Bible and we're reading about people and we think, you know, when we make a picture or a image of Peter, you know, through history, we'll put a halo over his head to show that he's a holy and special man. And we'll make Peter out to be, you know, perfect. But when we read the real Bible, and read the stories of Peter, we find out he was very human and very liable to weakness. Even after he was filled with the Spirit of God on the day of Pentecost, we read about 10 years down the road where Peter wouldn't sit with the Gentile Christians when the fundamentalist Jew Christians were around because he was afraid of what they would think about him. And the Apostle Paul went to Peter and said, Hey, Peter, you're acting the hypocrite. He said that right to his face. To the Apostle Peter. Peter, you're being a hypocrite. And not only is it hurting you, and hurting the church, and hurting these Gentiles, and misleading these Jews, you're keeping separation in the church, now you're dragging Barnabas down with you. And so Peter, ordinary human being, used by God. What are you talking about, Rev? Why do you tell us stories like that? Because I want you to know and understand that the things you struggle with they don't exclude you from the kingdom of God. They don't exclude you from serving God. We do all those things. The Bible says, Paul said, the things that I wish I would do, Paul, the things that I wish I would do, I find myself not doing. And the things I don't want to do, I find myself doing. And he cries out, wretched man that I am, who should deliver me 
from this body of sin and death. I'm trapped in a world that's got made out of this material body, and it leads me astray. Wretched man that I am. And the answer is, there is now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. God knows all about your sin. He knows all about your weakness. He knows all about your strengths. He knows the whole story. And his answer is, that's why I sent my son to die for you. Because if that doesn't happen, you don't have a chance. But the fact is, I did. And he did. And his arm is around you. He'll not leave you nor forsake you. You walk with him. And hopefully you'll get wiser. Hopefully you'll grow. Hopefully you'll listen to the Spirit of God and get wisdom. That's what the book of Proverbs is all about. Making really good choices. Look at what he says here. Proverbs of Solomon, the man gifted by God with wisdom. Son of David, king of Israel. What's this all about? Well, it's for gaining wisdom and instruction. For understanding words of insight. Gaining wisdom and instruction. That first word, wisdom, okay? Well, let's just go back to the word parable itself. It's interesting that the Greeks, when they translated it, they translated it with a word, the word parable it means wise sayings. Okay, that's the Hebrew idea, the original idea. These are wise sayings. These are intelligent sayings. These are sayings we've gathered together, and they'll help you. They'll give you guidance and wisdom. And when the Greeks translated that, they used a word that means along the road. Along the road. Because wisdom is gained along the road. It's gained through life. Wisdom in this term has to do with practical ability to live an intelligent life. It's not about some philosophical concept that is removed from reality that we're trying to gain wisdom and understanding and this globe or this sphere of uh, impregnable intelligence. It's about walking in the world and making good choices and making good decisions and taking what really is and not making it out what we want it to be, but make it out really what it is. Because that's what is. And now how do we respond? And the idea of instruction. That's a the word just has to do with teaching kids in school. Okay? Teaching somebody things that they don't know and understand. He goes on and says, uh, receiving words of insight or understanding words of insight. Proverbs will teach you how to understand Proverbs. I watched on YouTube this week a man, he's a hundred, I don't know if he's still alive now, I'm not sure how old the video is, but a 109 year old man. And a uh, black guy from, uh, I'm not sure where he's from, but he was a genuine World War II veteran. And he's still driving, the point, at this time he was driving a, I think about a 1975 Ford pickup. And uh, he smoked cigars all day long, right? Man of wisdom. 109 years old. See, we can smoke cigars all the time and it won't hurt us. I'm not saying that. I'm saying it out of interest. He said, I smoke them the healthy way. I don't inhale. I thought that was rather amusing. But anyways, talking to this guy and he's 109 years old, and just to listen to him is to gain wisdom. It's to gain understanding. We're surrounded by people who have been around the block. And they've made foolish choices, and they've made mistakes, and they've done things that were wrong, and they've learned the hard way, and they're here to tell about it. And they make great choices. They can tell you, boy, I'll tell you what, here's the best thing I ever did. I'll tell you something, folks. I don't know how many people I've been with in the last days of their life, the very, in some cases, the very last hours or minutes of their lives. And so often, I like to just try and talk to them. And say, What's the best choice you ever made? What's the best thing you ever did in your life? And so often they'll say, I 
I chose to marry my wife. Or they'll say, I chose to marry my husband. And these are all people who are just like us. These are people that squabble and argue over the stupidest things. You know, uh, my mom and dad would be driving down. Well, we're going to United Wesley College, right? We're going to Allentown for the first time. And, uh, you know, so we're going down Route 22, and you got to get off at, uh, I think, the Cedar Street exit. I don't know. Well, we come to the Cedar Street exit, and there's a sign that says United Wesley College, and there's an arrow pointing that way. And Mom says, Al, we're supposed to turn up here. <coughs> no, I've got a better way. I was looking on the map. I got a better, this is my dad. I got a better way to go. Well, about 25 minutes later, when we're getting close to Easton, which if you know Allentown, you know it's Allentown, Bethlehem, Easton. Yeah, he's probably, I don't know, 12, 15 miles out of his way. He says, you know, I guess it's time to turn around and go back <laughs> and go the way. That's mom and dad. You know? But in the end, I just did a simple thing. I chose your mother. It's the best choice I ever made. That's ordinary life. That's real life. It's daily living. And we do things that shape our character. We're instructed in ways that will make us wise. Listen to what a piece of wisdom here. It's in verse 8 of chapter 1 of Proverbs. Well, before I get there, let me just get to this one here. It's going to set up. It says here... Verse 4, giving prudence to those who are simple. Okay? Verse 4, prudence or discretion to those who are simple. That word simple, what it does, it doesn't mean you're, they're stupid. Okay? A simpleton. What it means is they're inexperienced. Okay? They're not savvy with the ways of the world. They haven't been around. Young people. Okay? And so he picks up in verse 8, and he says, Listen, my son, to your father's instruction. Son, you're simple. Not a simple thing. You just haven't experienced enough of life to understand and to make good choices. You're open to deception because so many things in this world are so deceptive. The Bible can't say more about false prophets. We're surrounded by people who are deceived and intentionally deceive and people who willingly are deceived. Well, listen, my son, to your father's instruction. And don't forsake your mother's teaching. You know how much power is in those two sayings right there? You know the greatest source of wisdom in your life is your mom and dad. They're the ones who raised you. They love you like nobody else. Oh, Reverend, you don't know my parents. They really didn't love us because, uh, but I'm starting to think back. Sometimes there are parents that don't love their children. I think it's really rare. I think more often the people who are categorized as those who don't love their children are really weak people who've really made bad choices and got themselves into habits and situations that they can't break. They're in bondage. And their children suffer because of it. They love their children. They wish they took care of them properly. But they, it's as if they can't help themselves. I'm telling you something, folks. We should look around us and see the power of sin. The world doesn't want us to think that there's such a thing as sin. The world doesn't want us to think that the Ten Commandments don't mean anything. The world doesn't want us to think that this Bible is any kind of book of wisdom or understanding or any kind of truth or any kind of guidance. Uh, let's make it up as we go along. Uh, and we're seeing all around us how our culture is just collapsing around us socially, morally, ethically. We're doing things that are unbelievable. Mom and Dad love you. Listen to them. Treasure their words. <coughs> understand their words. That's a part of wisdom is to understand the words of the wise. Somebody wrote a sermon one time. It was, how do you listen to a sermon? 
okay? Which is great because the things that are being explained, the things that are being spoken of, they need to be put into context. They need to be put into certain understanding. There's a proverb back here in the back of the book of Proverbs. Let's see here. Proverbs 26, chapter 4. Don't answer a fool according to his folly. Or you yourself will be just like him. Don't argue with a donkey, or you'll end up being a donkey. Right? That's what we say when we use other words. And then you know what the next proverb says? Answer a fool according to his folly. Wait a minute. You just said don't answer a fool. It says in verse 4, don't answer a fool according to his folly, or you yourself will be just like him. The next proverb says, answer a fool according to his folly, or he'll be wise in his own eyes. See, the Bible contradicts itself. That's why we throw the whole thing away. Because it says one thing, and then it says another, and obviously, two things can't be true. Or can they? Or can they be put into context and understood? Remember the honeymooners? I don't know if y'all remember the episode when uh, Carlos the Mambo dancer moved in next door, right? And so it's, you know, classic honeymooners, the funniest thing that was ever on TV, maybe. And Carlos comes and he starts teaching the women in the apartment complex the Mambo. And they're all together and they're all dancing and doing this Mambo. And Carlos, he works at night. He's a dancer and he teaches and so... He's around all day to teach him. Well, Ralph is out driving the bus. Norton's down there working in the sewer. <laughs> and Ralph comes home one day, and the music's playing. They got the old record player playing. They're all doing the mambo and having a blast. And Mrs. Manicotti's doing the mambo. And the whole crew, and Ralph walks in and he looks at and says, Oh, okay. And he walks in. What? <laughs> and then he turns around in shock. What's going on here? He goes crazy. And she says, Carlos is teaching us the mambo. Oh, Carlos is teaching the mambo. That makes a world of difference. Everybody out of here. <laughs> and they said, but Mrs. Cramp, Mr. Cramp, it is fun. And then somebody I think Alice says, oh, Ralph, everybody's doing it. And Ralph says, everybody's doing it? Everybody's doing it? And then Alice says, well, he says, no, you said everybody's doing it. He said, I'm not doing it. My grandmother never did it. <laughs> well, we talk that way all the time. <coughs> never did it. You always do this. You never do that. All these people are thus in such a way. And we don't mean it as an absolute saying. A wise person listens to somebody speaking and assesses what they're saying and isn't trying to put them in a box and catch them in a everybody's doing it word if you want wisdom, understand what the person's saying. When you say everybody's doing it, it doesn't mean everybody's doing it. It means it's a lot of fun. We're doing it. A lot of people find it a good thing. It doesn't mean everybody. So when we read in Proverbs where it says, don't answer a fool according to his folly, or you yourself will be just like him. And that's true. You ever get in an argument with an idiot? <laughs> yeah. It never ends. And you end up exasperated and trying to make points that don't make points. and It just doesn't work. Before long, you're there standing there arguing and the people around you are thinking, what's the matter with those two? And they don't care who's right or who's wrong. They just know that all you people, you, you two are just arguing. And then there's another truth. Answer a fool according to his folly. <laughs> so sometimes it's smart not to argue with somebody. Because you'll end up being a fool like they are. But sometimes it's right to instruct a fool. Or else they'll never learn the right way. Wisdom is the understanding of when to do which. <coughs> when should I correct somebody and when should I stay away from it? We talk about this all the time, you know. You got kids, you want to help your kids, want to give them guidance, want to give them instruction. And if I push hard enough, drive them away. 
but there's still a place for instructing kids now, isn't there? And if you don't instruct them, who will? Talking about the gospel, okay? If nobody ever tells somebody the gospel, how will they ever know? But not every situation is a good situation to be explaining the gospel. So the wise person gets this inner instinct, this inner understanding of how to do things in a wise way and how to make choices. And that's what these words wisdom really mean. Let's just get through a couple of these. Prudence keeps coming up. What is prudence? It's shrewdness or cunning. You know who the prudent person in the Bible is? The serpent in Genesis chapter 3. Satan was the most subtle, the serpent was the most subtle creature on earth. That's that word, prudent. Prudence can be used for good or evil. Shrewdness or cunning. The ability to work out clever ways of addressing a problem. Wisdom will give you that. This book of Proverbs will help you figure out different ways to look at things. It'll exercise your mind. How about deliberation? And that's really the idea of discretion. Deliberation. To plan the intents of the Lord's heart. God has a deliberate plan. He's thinking ahead how to bring to accomplishment the things he desires. We can have the wisdom to bring to accomplishment the things we desire. The idea of discretion. To be circumspect in speech or behavior, especially to avoid social disgrace or embarrassment. Circumspect, that's a great word. You know what circumspect means? Two words, circle and spect like spectacles, or a spectator, or a spectacle that you're something that you watch. And so circumspect is the ability to look around and see that there's more going on than just what you're staring at. There's more things involved, there's moving parts, there's things you've got to figure out. Discretion, you get that through Proverbs. And finally, the idea of discerning something. The idea to separate divide, mark off, make distinctions. <clears throat> to be able to choose and make a distinction. These people are both saying the same thing that they seem to be, but I'm going to make a decision here. I'm going to make a choice based on what? That's wisdom. That's understanding. And so the Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, the king of Israel, for gaining wisdom and instruction, okay? For gaining practical ability to live a profitable, wise life. And instruction, the ability to gain understanding because we're all simple to a certain degree. We never get done learning. We never get done acquiring new understanding. And as we go through life, we come through different situations that we never approached before and now we need help. For receiving instruction in prudent behavior, doing what is right and just and fair. It's not always easy to do what's right, just and fair, is it? You have to make choices, decisions. Sometimes we're trying to be right and just and fair for this person, and we're hurting 75 other people over here because all we're doing is thinking of this one. Mm -hmm. And so we've got to have the ability to be, again, <laughs> circumspect, to look around. Let the wise listen and add to their learning. And let the discerning, those who can make a distinction, get guidance. We need help in making distinctions. Proverbs gives it to us. The Spirit of God gives it to us. For understanding Proverbs and parables, just to be able to understand the sayings of the wise. Sayings and riddles of the wise. The fear of the Lord. Respect for the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. <coughs> But you know, fools despise wisdom and instruction. The fear of the Lord. I love that. It's intentionally chosen, the word fear. What does it mean? We retranslate it off in respect or awe or, or you know, and, and those are really good words and they get to the There's a dog down the alley who 
well, there's really two big ones up here. And I fear them. When I'm walking around with Murphy Boy, when, when Murphy was a little tiny puppy, just about this big, I had a pit bull come roaring out of the house. He busted the door open and he came and he would eat Murphy for lunch. I had him at the end of a rope and I was swinging him away from the dog. And Murphy's looking at me and I'm swinging him and this dog's following around in circles. And finally I got Murphy up in my arms and I thought I'm going to have to address that pit bull. And then his owners come out and finally they got control of him. But it was horrifying. And so now, I respect those dogs up there. I fear them. I don't go by their house. And if I do get up in that direction, I look from a long distance and look to see what's going on up there. See if they're out, see if they're around. They're the size of cows and horses. I mean, these two things are huge. So I know what they're capable of, and I make way for it. That's the fear of the Lord. To know who he is and what he's capable of. To know his power. To know his authority and his justice. And to respect that and honor it. That's the beginning of wisdom. Until you fear the Lord, you can't gain wisdom. You've got to have him in the equation. That's the beginning. That's the ground floor. That's where you start. But the problem is fools despise wisdom and instruction. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your holy word. <coughs> Because again, you haven't left us as orphans here in this world. You have given us the gift of the Spirit of God, the promise of the Father, the Holy Spirit to dwell in our hearts. But you've also given us the written words of God that were inspired by that same Holy Spirit. And then you have given us the church, full of wise people. You've given us moms and dads. We have teachers. And we all have the ability to grow, to decrease our simpleness, and increase our sophistication, not in some arrogant way, but so we can properly navigate the life that you've laid before us. Thank you so much, Father, for calling us to these things and giving us these great gifts. And we ask you to help us to walk with you faithfully here in this world, and we'll be thankful forever in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, ladies and gentlemen. Let us turn in our hymnals to 532. Five three two.
please help us. To get the fear of the Lord straight. That we receive Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. And put him in his proper place. And put ourselves in our proper place. That's the fear of the Lord. And that's the beginning of all wisdom. Thank you for these things in Jesus' name. Amen.